The HD6000 series is, nominally, the second generation of DirectX 11 cards from AMD. But the 6000 series was, at best, a refresh of the TerraScale 2 architecture, and at the lower end of the performance scale, a plain copy-paste of a previous HD5000. However, the HD6000 series also came with a price reduction, especially at the lower end of the performance. The HD6850 was, despite its 850 moniker, a higher performing mid-range card. You see, AMD decided to further segment the market and reserve the top tier to the new 6900 cards. Like all TerraScale 2 cards, the 6850 supports DirectX 11, but not Vulkan. And like all pre-GCN AMD cards, but also an RDNA 2 one we might add, does not support video encoding. According to Tech Power Up, the name of the GPU is BARTS, and as mentioned before, it was developed using the TerraScale 2 architecture. With 960 shader cores, 48 TMUs and 32 ROPs, the GPU is paired with 1GB of GDDR5 memory via a 256-bit bus. Running the GPU at 775 MHz and the memory at 1000, the HD6850 is expected to have a maximum power consumption of 127 watts, or as some like to say, 7F watts. The cooling solution that Sapphire opted for is very unusual. Typically, video card cooling solutions come in two flavors. Axial fans, where the air flows along the axis of the fan and onto a heatsink or through a fin stack and then gets dumped mostly inside the case. And blower style coolers, where the fan uses the centrifugal force to blow air in a radial pattern and then use a shroud to force the air through a fin stack and then out of the case through the holes in the second slot cover. Well, Sapphire uses both in this card, and this is even visible in the shape of the fan, where the inner part of it works in an axial fashion, and the outer edge is twisted to add a radial component to the airflow. The shroud is shaped to act as a duct, so that a large portion of the air is exhausted through the holes in the second slot. Some of it gets dumped in the case as well, since some of the airflow is intended to escape the shroud, as it also cools down the VRMs. As for the passive part of the cooling, Sapphire is using a fin stack and two copper heat pipes that contact the GPU through a copper cold plate. The shape of the fin stack aims to make the best use of the radial airflow while also allowing some of it to escape and, as mentioned previously, cool down the VRMs. Apex Legends struggles a bit with the 6850, with 37 FPS average at 1080p low settings and 1% lows at 20. Despite these low numbers, I was pleasantly surprised to see the card playing the title at all. My previous adventures using another TerraScale 2 card didn't turn out that well. At 720p, the value increases to 53 FPS average and 36 FPS 1% lows. With an FSR tool, you may be able to try out a bit of multiplayer fun and still have an image of 1080p scaled up from 720p using the quality settings. Warzone fails to launch. One might say that it provides an identical experience as with the HD5770. Yay for consistency, I guess? By the enemy. However, unlike Warzone, Battlefield 5 manages to launch. And in a similar vein as with the previously mentioned card, the FPS numbers are not that good. The average is 37 FPS in the multiplayer training match at 720p low settings, with 1% lows at 20. These are lower values than the following generation HD7770, 
which managed to provide better performance at a less power draw. Control didn't perform much better. With an average FPS of almost 25 and 1% loads of 11 at 720p low settings, the card is better than the HD5770 from the same architecture, but very much like with Battlefield 5, the GCN mid-range 7770 will provide better performance at lower power consumption. Rainbow Six Siege is starting to become playable in a multiplayer sense of the word only at 720p low settings with averages of 56 FPS at 100% resolution scale and 73 FPS at 50% resolution scale. The 1% lows at these scale values are 37 FPS at full scale and 44 FPS at 50%. Alien Isolation remains an easy to play title in terms of hardware requirements. This corridor first person game averages 52 FPS at 1080p ultra settings. And thanks to the 1% lows of 34, the single player title plays fine on the 6850. For CSGO we use the DA dust map and play the bot match at 1080p low settings. The 6850 reached an average FPS of 121 and 1% lows of 69. This old GPU will allow a high refresh rate experience in this game. Dota 2 behaves similarly well at 1080p low settings. The average FPS reached is 96, and the 1% low value is 52. The video card has a bit of headroom, so you can play a bit with the settings to improve the visuals. The typical benchmark for Fortnite is a short walk around the, the Joneses area. At 1080p, in performance mode and using a view distance of far, the card averaged 83 FPS and had the 1% lows at 39. Rocket League is a game easy to run at 1080p low settings. The 6850 hits an average of 100 FPS in this game and the 1% lows of 36 FPS are not a major issue in this title and the game experience is enjoyable. Splitgate players are likely to be happy with how the 6850 performs at both 1080p and 720p low settings. If the average and 1% lows at 1080p of 58 and 26 FPS respectively are deemed too low, lowering the resolution to 720p increases these values to 101 and 43 FPS. FSR apps can then upscale the 720p image up to 1080p at the quality level for FSR. Valorant is one of the least demanding games at 1080p low settings. The average frame rate that the 6850 manages to hit is 146, while the 1% lows have the comfortable value of almost 85. There seems to be a bit of headroom here to improve the visuals for this game by changing some of its settings. Genshin Impact will run acceptably at 1080p low settings and render scale of 1. The average reaches 54 FPS and the 1% lows are at 37. The values are quite ok for this game due to its slower pace. Paladins, however, is better played at over 60 FPS, and the 6850 delivers. At 1080p and a mix of settings, the average reaches 155 FPS, and the 1% lows reaches almost 75 FPS. The game experience here is good, 
and there is headroom to increase the visuals. Another game from the same developer, A Realm Royale, performs quite well. Unlike the previous game, the game map is significantly larger, so the FPS drops a bit. However, at 1080p and a mix of settings, mostly on high, the average of 83 FPS is quite good. The 1% lows of almost 45 FPS is also acceptable. Rogue Company also ran fine at 1080p low settings. The average reached by the 6850 is almost 67 FPS. The 1% lows of 23 FPS might cause some eyebrows to raise, however, each time the player is eliminated, the camera switches, and it feels that this camera switch is more responsible for these values. I haven't found yet a way to trick World of Tanks Blitz to allow an FPS cap higher than 60, so the values reported in this game are affected by this. The game plays smoothly, with an average of 59 FPS and 1% lows of 49. Warframe, in the same Mariana mission, now turned to benchmark, managed to average 89 FPS at 1080p lower settings. The game plays well, and with 1% lows of 48 FPS, you should have no problem running this PvE game. Used GPUs will always be good as a stopgap solution, until you get the money for the GPU that you really want but that is as long as the market is fairly stable. And once the GPU of your dreams comes knocking at your door, you now have the option to resell the old GPU to recover most if not all of your initial investment, again, as long as the market is stable enough. APUs are touted as a better solution than using an old GPU, however, the iGPU does not come for free. You either pay for it in performance of the CPU, or in play money, as is in the case of Intel. In case of AMD, the iGPUs in their G series of Ryzen APUs are quite good, but without a non-G, non-X equivalent CPU, it is more difficult to assess the cost of their iGPU in either price or performance. In the case of Intel, however, the difference is exactly 25 USD for their Core i5 line of CPUs, and up until Alder Lake, for 25 USD, the odds of buying an old discrete GPU that beats the i5 iGPU are quite good. Do I need to mention that you can even increase that budget if you plan to resell the old GPU? As a stopgap card, the HD6850 is more difficult to recommend, mainly because the power consumption number works against it. More so, a good working 6850 goes for as much as an HD7770. And while the former will dominate in games and settings that rely on high pixel rate, the latter will run newer games that make good use of shaders, like Control, Battlefield 5, and Apex Legends, at a higher frame rate and much lower power consumption. And since hardware-supported video encoding was introduced with GCN, Terascale-based cards lack another feature that the newer cards have. Well, not all the newer cards. The sample that I got underwent some dramatic and traumatic experiences to get back to a running state. And while it can be used to detect what type of rendering limitations a game runs into, this HD6850 holds more of a sentimental value to me, as being the first card that I basically wrecked, and also the first card that I managed to bring back to life. And while wrecking it was accidental, bringing it back to life was the main objective when I decided to buy this used, non-working card. <laughs> 